Mimi, I think you are ready to start. Excellent, excellent. Well, good evening. I'm Mimi Love. I'm a principal at UTL and co-chair of the 2021 BSA Honor and Awards Committee, along with Raquel Davey. Um, she's here with me, a senior project manager at Redgate. And just to give you a little bit of insight, we cannot see any of your faces, but we imagine a, a massive audience out there. And we're really delighted that you could attend um, this evening's lecture by the 2020 Earls R. Flansburg recipient, Patricia Gruitz. She's the senior principal at Mass Design Group and uh, Raquel will give us more information on her in a second. We had hoped to be meeting in person, but here we are on Zoom and I really appreciate you all being here with us. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about this award. It's named after Earl R. Flansburg, FAIA, a distinguished Boston architect and founder of Flansburg Associates. He had a long and um, brilliant career lasting more than 45 years in Boston and a very long history with the BSA. Um, he believed that a well-designed building improves the quality of our lives. Um, and throughout his career, he generously supported emerging professionals and advocated for women architects. This award is also co-sponsored by his family, the Flansburgs. So interesting fun fact that I learned today, early in his career, he hired and promoted female architects, two local celebs, Andrea Lears and Jane Weinsaffel, um, were some of his early employees at Flansburg Architect, I mean at Flansburg Associates. So a um, shout out to them. So who's eligible for this award? Students and emerging architectural professionals and aspiring architects under the age of 40. That's all, that's pretty, uh, a pretty open uh, category of, of people. So we imagine that most of you that are listening in are eligible for this award. Um, the BSA is currently accepting applications and the deadline to submit for the 2021 Flansburg Young Designers Award is September 30th. Um, and before I pass it on to Raquel to introduce Patricia, just want to give a quick shout out to Catherine Faulkner and Eric Howler, who were the co-chairs for the 2020 Honors and Awards Committee and led the jury selection last year. Elizabeth Stifel and Reagan Shields Ives were also on the jury in 2020, along with Raquel and me. And with that, I'll hand it over to Raquel. Thank you, Mimi. Well, so welcome everyone. And um, I have the pleasure of introducing Patricia. Um, so I'll get right into it. Um, so Patricia Gruitz is an architect, senior principal and managing director with Mass Design Group, leading both design and research projects in health, education and equity. Since joining Mass in 2013, she has led the design of the maternity waiting village in Malawi with the Malawi Ministry of Health, the African Leadership University, a series of primary schools in East Africa with the African Wildlife Foundation and the N Squared Foundations. So currently Patricia leads design and research initiatives at Mass with a focus on planning, design and evaluation. Her work is aimed at engaging and empowering stakeholders to the design process, supporting and substantiating the impact of design on health, social and environmental outcomes, and translating research into design strategies and decision-making. She has coordinated the creation of Purpose-Built Series, a set of tools for creating impact driven design and has implemented this approach in the design of affordable, affordable housing, healthcare and urban design projects around the globe. Patricia has also managed a range of design projects aimed at proving the impact of built environment on individual and community health in the United States, including a collaboration with the mayor's working group to address issues of homelessness, addiction and recovery in Boston and a multi-year research study to design trauma's resilient communities with the preservation of affordable housing. Patricia has taught studios focusing on social impact at RISD. Her work has been published in journals of architecture and health and was recently awarded the top 40 under 40 for sustainable design by Impact Design Hub. So the honors and awards selection committee appreciated the global impact 
of mass design and recognize Patricia's role in, in their projects. Beyond building, Patricia emphasized the impact of the process of engagement. The committee appreciated the compelling toolkit designed for purpose built as well. With that said, the, community, the committee hopes this award to Patricia catalyzes future impact driven projects in All right, that should make it better. Thanks everyone. And thank you all for joining. It really means a lot to me um, for those of you that came, both that know me and those that don't, those that know Mass Design Group and those that don't. I really think this is an incredible opportunity um, to get to know all of you and just for you all to get to know me a bit better. Um, and first, you know, thank you too to the BSA and to the Flansburg family for this award. It's an honor to be the recipient of this award and an honor to be able to share my work and my perspective as a young architect here in Boston. Um, tonight, I want to share with you some of my work, um, what I'm learning, most importantly, and how it's shaping my perspective on the role of an architect and my hope uh, to create a new culture of practice. And that culture really is based on some ideas that I've been forming around principles of proof that design matters, around a culture of accompaniment, a culture of disruption, and one of advocacy. And I'll start with a little bit about me. Um, after working for a number of years in Boston as a truly young architect, just out of grad school, I was invited to Haiti after the 2011 earthquake to support a local nonprofit there in reconstruction of a health clinic. And after arriving in Haiti with such a devastating natural disaster and, and furthermore, uh, an epidemic of cholera, which soon after landed in the country, where buildings and poor building practices had killed people, there was clearly a need for architects and for quality infrastructure. But the problem seemed really vast and the architectural solution seemed so small and surface level. I found myself entirely unprepared and ill-equipped for the task at hand and really wondering, where do you even begin? And I think back to what architecture school and what the practice to that point had really taught me. It had taught me that basic services for architects were defined as schematic design, design development, construction documents, bidding and contract administration, and that naming those as basic services suggests that they're adequate to deliver a successful project. But in these contexts of true social and systemic issues, it's just not enough. And I think as we're learning more about it, it's not enough anywhere. The practice of architecture that I'd experienced up to that point always had a clear client. It had a clear design brief or an RFP that mandated what the project was and how the architecture would fit in. I had been taught that the role of the architect really lied between these two discrete phases of just design and construction. And the rest of it was really left to someone else. I was lucky at the time to also know Mass Design Group and really to be the, inspired by the work of my now colleagues who were looking at into these big and really leaning into these big systemic and societal problems around infectious disease, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, working in communities that had lack of electricity and a need for infrastructure here in Rwanda post-genocide. And this is an image of the Bataro Hospital where they were defining the project goals, engaging with stakeholders, leveraging design, and connecting design decisions to outcomes that address these issues. Poor ventilation in hallways were making people sicker. Let's move the hallways outdoors. Lack of staff oversight, let's create shared uh, medical wards, but invert the bed locations to give people privacy and views. And in doing so, let's think more so about the process and leverage expertise, ingenuity, skills, and material of the place. Dignified, beautiful design, but in it modeling a role and questioning for architects 
what more we could do. And so when I joined Mass in 2013, um, we began to work for other nonprofits and other served communities elsewhere around the globe. We started working with the Safe Motherhood Initiative in Malawi, building the maternity waiting homes. It was then that I met the leader of an organization. And when I showed her images of our projects and work in Bataro in Rwanda, she replied to me, sure, you can do that in Rwanda, but you can't build like that here. And what she really meant was that we can't afford good design here. And the problem stems from this basic idea that good design is really shorthand for beauty or for aesthetics, which is thought of really as costly and therefore really only for the wealthy. It's something nice to have if you can afford it, not something that's fundamental to the delivery of care, the use of a program, the dignity of a community. And being able to prove that design mattered never felt so critical to me. So I'll give a little context for those of you that don't know Malawi. Um, when I started working with the Safe Motherhood Initiative um, in the, for the Maternity Waiting Home Project, Malawi had one of the highest rates of maternal mortality and infant mortality in the world. And this is in part due to the fact that their clinics are far away from villages and the journey is challenging for anyone, let alone a woman who's about to give birth. To solve for this issue, the government established what was called a maternity waiting home a place where a woman could come and stay in close proximity to the hospital while she was, or before she was in labor. So that when she did go into labor, she was able to receive the care from a skilled medical professional. At the time, the government design, which is here on the left, um, was a barracks-like building with 36 women crowded into one dark shared room. There was criticism about the effectiveness of the maternity waiting home program and some criticism because the facilities took women out of their communities, away from their families, their work, and their cultural traditions. We were brought in to help improve upon this model um, to see where there were opportunities um, to improve upon what the, the Ministry of Health architect had quickly defined. We realized that maternity waiting homes weren't just about providing shelter. The real opportunity was creating community spaces where women could begin a shared collective experience of motherhood. And so our questions were, how can we design a maternity waiting home that encourages women to come and stay? How can it transform waiting into a positive, productive experience? And if it's supposed to be a home, can it reflect these women's personal experiences? We started with some very specific design decisions aimed to achieve and encourage an improved experience for mothers. First, by breaking down this barn-like structure into smaller bedroom units to encourage social interaction and connection. We allowed for natural ventilation and wind. We pitched the roofs to create shade where we needed it. And again, to collect water for comfort and health. We extended the roofs to create a continuous covered walking path. And then we wrapped the facility, creating privacy and security. And then this created a model, a model that could be built or added to in phases over time, responding to really limited budget that the government had at any given time to develop additional homes when needed. We took our design cues from the villages around and in the incredible social interactions they supported. We made our facility a village, a series of intimate sleeping rooms arrayed around a series of courtyards and added common spaces for cooking to support women's independence while staying at the home and incorporated bench seating so women could gather and talk in the shade outdoors that would double as sleeping spaces for their family members at night, aiming to reduce the stress of mothers who were experiencing that they were experiencing when family members not accommodated in the Ministry of Health Design were left to sleep outside and often on the ground and exposed to weather conditions. Because of the constraints of the project, it was really important that every design element do at least three things, or at least multiple things. Um, material choices were also driven by our intended impact. The CSDB blocks were not only providing an alternative material to others that would further deforestation in the area, but their thickness created a thermal mass, which was keeping the building cool during the day and warm at night. And between the space of these columns, it was used for seating, shelving, and sleeping spaces. After the building opened in 2015, we did an impact evaluation and surveyed 600 women, comparing our maternity waiting village to a comparable government maternity waiting home facility. Using the survey tool, which gathered patient demographic and pregnancy data, as well as perceptions of the facility, space, attributes, qualities, and experiences, using a Likert scale of evaluation, we were able to take that qualitative data and quantify it. 
essentially the evaluation proved that the new design had a much higher user satisfaction because it was not viewed as an institution, but as a community space for mothers to support one another. It also understanding also resulted in an understanding of which spatial attributes and design qualities had the greatest influence on creating a positive experience for mothers. So in basic terms, it means that as maternity weight This evaluation and study resulted in a written report, which was accepted by a peer-reviewed journal, Midwifery, and an example of how architects can contribute to the developing proof and value of design. I'm just going to share with you also what I think is really important while we are proving things quantitative and qualitatively is also just the importance of telling a story in our work. You know, what I think what I learned through that project um, is really what's truly possible um, if we work outside of the assumed phases of just design and construction and support our partners through all phases, through visioning, through planning of a project, sorry, um, the visioning and planning of a project and all the way through evaluation and occupancy. One of the things that we've started to learn is that many nonprofit leaders, like unlike the Ministry of Health, may only take on one building project in their lifetimes, which means that they really have no idea what to expect or how to make the most out of the investment that they're about to make. And while most nonprofits, if not all, have a physical space, a place where they deliver services or programs, actually less, of the, less than half of them see them as real, as, see their buildings or real estate as a strategic asset. And so this idea of having an expanded process isn't just to encourage, for the, encourage a role for architects, but it's also to insist that architects play a role guiding our clients and partners through this process. In 2014, Mass was commissioned by the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation and the Atlantic Philanthropies, who are two of the largest philanthropic givers to building projects around the globe. And they had asked us to conduct a multifaceted study to understand the building process and how nonprofits approached it. They wanted us to capture lessons learned from these processes of built buildings, not ones that Mass had designed, but ones that have been built 
um, outside of us to create a series of case studies so that we could capture the lessons learned and share with other organizations who are considering a building project. Through this research project, we gained this 360 degree view of capital projects and learned about the less tangible, but really vital ways that the building environment shapes behaviors and outcomes. From these 18 case studies, ranging from a $40,000 uh, 40, primary care facility in rural Vietnam to a $500 million science and education institute in San Francisco. And there are a few takeaways that I just wanna share with you today about what we learned from those building processes. The first one is that capital and projects can have a measurable impact on its end user, but that's not where it ends. It also has an impact on the organizations that build it, the communities in which it sits and systems in which, and sectors in which it falls. It will have ripple effects to change all of those. The success or fa failure is also based on the ability for an organization to manage and balance the mission, design, and feasibility of a project through its completion. What we mean by that is that a mission really is that an organization needs to have a clear and simple idea about what they're trying to do, about their goals for the project. They have to have that North Star. The design of the project then must respond to those outcomes that are intended there have to be clear links between how the design actually achieves that mission. And lastly, it has to be balanced with what the, what the organization can not only just originally afford to build, but also what they can operate and maintain for the long term. And when, those, when that balance is achieved, then we see successful projects. But it is a challenge for many organizations and funders who lack the knowledge, experience, and tools to plan and implement projects successfully. It's also recognizing that the design process is really unclear, confusing, missing critical steps. And architects use a lot of jargon, which make it no easier for anyone involved. And so what we tried to do was unravel and untangle this process to make it transparent where it was opaque, clear where it was confusing, and try to lower the learning curve for nonprofits who oftentimes may be taking on this capital project for the first time and the only time in their lives. And so one of the key tools that came out of this research is called the Planning for Impact tool. It outlines five typical phases of visioning, planning, design, construction, and occupancy, and overlays with them the key fundamental framework of mission design and feasibility, and outlines key questions that every organization and architect should be discussing and answering as they go through the building process. The Planning for Impact tool is just one of many resources in this set. It's open source documents that are available for download on our website. And we've created a series of tools and worksheets. One of the most recent ones here is actually a tool called the Partner Readiness Assessment. And it's designed to help designers and organizations assess where they are in the design process. As many of you know, organizations approach an architect, sometimes asking for a rendering or for a design or for construction documents when they're not even sure what they're gonna do. And so this tool is actually to help lead those initial conversations to ensure that a project is scoped correctly and an organization equipped to make tough decisions. This purpose-built process has been leveraged and validated with our nonprofit clients who don't always have a roadmap and who are the ones doing this for the first time. But one of the challenges that I've been working on recently is actually looking at how this process can disrupt existing markets and systems that are more well-developed and encouraging people to work differently. One of those sectors is in affordable housing. Fundamentally understanding how broken and harmful our housing system is, makes it easy for most developers building housing just to state their mission or goal for the project is just adding the number of affordable units to a community. But we all know that one of the major challenges beyond that isn't just quantity of housing, but quality. And housing is complex. It's got multiple stakeholders, decision makers, funding streams, and we've edited and taken our purpose-built toolkits to this developer process to help articulate a mission and impact for their work and identify which elements are most important to achieving it. One project where we applied this process is on a senior age-restricted affordable housing project here in Boston. We're working with two life communities whose mission is to design housing for older adults. 
In Massachusetts, where this project is cited, the affordability of living is an acute issue for seniors. And as senior population grows, expected to increase 53% over the next 20 years, providing additional affordable units is the critical need. And while there's a movement in the US to promote aging in place, which aims to keep seniors living in their own homes as long as possible, Two Life's model seeks to take this a step further to address issues of social isolation and loneliness that have been defined as public health issues for seniors. The, the idea is that by creating an opportunity for seniors to live in community, we can avoid seniors in isolation and providing means to live better, longer, together. This is the context of the project, which sits in Brighton, just on Chestnut Hill Ave. Highlighted in orange are the J.J. Carroll Apartments, which are the current, currently seen as obsolete. Unfortunately, they are currently housed by the Boston Housing Authority, built in this early part of the 19th century, and have created a lot of interesting and challenging accessibility issues for the seniors living there, meaning that many of them are shut in. But what it did provide us with is an opportunity to actually understand the needs of those specific seniors that were already living in this context, in this place, which is a rarity in housing, to actually know who you're designing for. These seniors would be relocated during construction and brought back into the J.J. Carroll apartments if they so choose. And so one of our main questions in the engagement wasn't just understanding the context of the project, but really understanding these unique opportunities, the needs of the residents, both current and future, and what their definition of community was, not only to like definition of community. And so given this idea, we really looked at you know, standard mo models of affordable housing, looking at the most efficient way to build what would be 150 units, you leverage a typical double loaded corridor. 150 units or even 30 units per floor though, was seen as too many for people in this community to understand how they would develop meaningful natural social interactions. The current housing at JJ Carroll were walk-up apartments where maybe a corridor was shared with four other residents at most. They really liked that level of intimacy that was created in the previous housing. So we worked with Two Life and the current residents to understand a smaller grouping, four to eight units, which we call a cluster, that could break down the scale of the housing, deinstitutionalizing this overall housing block. We looked then to reduce the corridor length, connecting it with a spine, and shifting to create a meaningful, unique outdoor areas and access to nature and views, and then creating destinations of programs along the way. This is a plan for the upper units as it's evolved in the diagram to a building with the residential clusters connecting by community and residential programs. In the lower level, entirely semi-public space with health center dedicated to elderly and adult day center, expanding the community beyond the walls of the building to community resident programs facing the street and outdoor plaza. And lastly, really prioritizing access to nature. In age-restricted affordable housing, everyone's over the age of 65 and of similar demographic age group. It's important for communities to be diverse and intergenerational interaction is critical for people to thrive. So we created an intergenerational play area for residents, their families, and people living in the surrounding neighborhood to come together. As we were nearing completion of the construction documents for that project, um, COVID-19 hit. And it was interesting because we had already been sort of looking at these risks for seniors around social isolation, but it was being exacerbated by the risk that seniors were facing of COVID-19. And so we began a research study looking with the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard and other key partners in the housing space, other developers um, and researchers to understand how do we design then for safe interaction, not social isolation. And so we put together a series of, of tools and diagrams, building off of our experience at Mass, working in infection control abroad, we leveraged best practices and aligned with what we were learning in the affordable housing space. We learned how to break down the scale, create safe spaces, create safe protocols that would help our housing providers and help our residents feel safe in their homes again. We advocated for simple solutions like operable windows and balconies, which then led us to wonder in the future if those elements like balconies, which are typically seen as luxury items, could actually could be advocated for as a necessity. 
And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which I think our profession is growing to really identify with individuals, advocacy, and individual interests. After working for a number of years in other communities, I finally had a reason to stay home in Boston for a while. My daughter was born and I was suddenly spending a lot of time at home and a lot of time awake looking out the windows of my flat on Mass Ave, one of the main arterials going through Boston, for those of you from out of town. Some of the time my neighborhood looks like this, but it also looks like this. It received the moniker Methadone Mile in 2016 in an article capturing the influx of people both using drugs and seeking social services for recovery in this neighborhood. The opioid epidemic, combination of addiction, homelessness, mental health issues, combined with other, with undercapacity social services had pushed the infrastructure beyond its capacity to serve. Here we see a staggering growth of opioid use in the US and in Massachusetts, these rates continue to rise. In 2016, the mayor established a working group specifically to address the needs of addiction and recovery and homelessness at the intersection of Mass Ave and Milnea Cass. I was invited to join as a neighbor to these conversations, but quickly realized that while a diverse group of stakeholders was talking about progressive policies and programs, no one was talking about design. Our team at Mass took on doing some research to understand the role design plays in creating healthy urban environments for all. It's just a brief history of Mass Cass where we started uncovering the legacy of this part of the city. The yellow lines indicate Massachusetts Avenue and then later as urban renewal took form, we see Melnea Cass coming in, dividing what was one city and one part of the city into four separate neighborhoods. As a hub in the early 1900s, the neighborhood fabric was cut in the 1970s. And it really, that, that divide of those four neighborhoods created an overall disinvestment and lack of ownership in the area. As the opioid crisis swelled, the services here in the area were over capacity and the undesigned public spaces were overwhelmed. It wasn't just that there had been disinvestment, but intentional decisions for removal and use of defensive architecture, fencing, removal of seats, etc. We call these spaces of exclusion, public spaces specifically designed to deter the public. With the working group, social services and other stakeholders, we asked, how could we make a place at this intersection while supporting the social service providers who are, and those seeking treatment. We could build an intersection not as a backdoor to the city, but as a gateway. We can invest in social service infrastructure, in new opportunities for supportive housing, and invest in alternative means and create opportunities for art and interaction in the public realm. Another structural issue that was uncovered through this working group was an issue around the continuum of care. People seeking treatment just are not receiving the care they need. And those that are trying to seek treatment find a lack of facilities to meet them along the way. Another sh kind of shocking realization was that this idea of sort of a warm handoff, which is an, an expression in healthcare, is an, is an innovation here. Addiction and recovery is the only illness where we do not help the patient navigate through the healthcare process to the next phase of recovery. We engaged experts in the field from Boston Public Health to social service providers to those recovering from addiction and asked for their vision of the future of care. We asked what if we created a model facility that co-located all facilities into one place? And if a stigma is a barrier to treatment, what if we could make a space for recovery or therapy that looks like this? Could, create, could we create thoughtful, purpose-built and beautifully designed spaces for recovery? Could we break down the walls that serve as barriers to treatment and think about new types of spaces and places where recovery could occur? The reality is like we don't know the solution to the opioid crisis. We won't fully understand the impact of one or two initiatives, but it doesn't mean that we should wait for that proof to do something. This work is just beginning for me. It's my community. It's something that I care about. And there are many big public health, social justice and human rights issues that we need to think creatively about how to solve. And we need, to we need architects and designers at that table to design the future that we want. 
One of the realities though to this is that only a diverse staff from a widely varied cultural and socioeconomic background is properly equipped to tackle these large pressing issues today. At Mass, we're a nonprofit. We also design ourselves, define ourselves as a collective, not only because we're not owned by anyone, but because collectively we have created a platform that creates opportunities for those on our team to pick up and lead initiatives and advocate for the issues that they care about and are personal to them. To support these issues, we've established what we call labs to tackle, look into, research, and elevate the issues that we care about. We also dedicate resources to them. This year, we launched a Space and Society Fellowship to bring together a cohort of young designers committed to this, these issues and committed to um, elevating their careers in an alternative means. And we're committed to addressing these issues here in Boston. We're expanding who we're working with and how we're working to make an impact here today. And also this fall, we'll open a new office in Boston on the ground floor to expand our reach and develop a culture of inclusion, one that invites the surrounding community, community of architects and advocates together to join us in creating this culture shift. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank that you. was it's a, it's amazing how much more we we I learned in particular from seeing your application and it's you know one of the award tenants is to or or what Earl Flansburg always said well designed buildings improve the quality of lives and I think you're doing that. So mm -hmm. so that's amazing. So yeah. I wanted to open that up to the chat for questions and you know we're happy to start a conversation here but if you have any questions please chime in in the chat um so where do we start oh my gosh there was so much Raquel please um <laughs> chime in I think one of my questions for you, because a lot of your early work started, and and maybe it, it's not chronological the way you showed it, um, but you started in, in Haiti, and then you were in Malawi, and a lot of your work, is, you know, now you're focused on is in the United States, and I can imagine, in the or at least my perception is that there's so many more hurdles in the United States, regulatory processes, et cetera, that you, you face. But how do you, how, what are the major, you know, obstacles that you see and, yeah. you know, where is your focus for changing it and not giving up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I wouldn't, it's, it's interesting because I do think there is this perception that working abroad or working in, in underdeveloped development systems means that it's either easier or that it's more straightforward. And I think what I found working in, in Haiti and in Malawi is that these are not straightforward systems. They are actually much more, in some ways, complex because they aren't transparent. They, they are, there are systems and approval processes which you may not see or aren't as clearly outlined or understood on a website. I feel like there is an understand that uh, transitioning to working in Boston and working with the city on a number of projects, working in affordable housing. I, there, are, there is an opportunity to actually be able to go to a website and download <laughs> like, like the rules and regulations and there is a roadmap. However, I would say that because those systems are so developed, we rely on them. We don't challenge them. We don't question them. And I think that's what I meant by trying to suggest a culture of disruption is that I think as architects, we understand where those systems don't work. Mm -hmm. We see where there's conflict. We see where there's contradiction. We see where it doesn't make sense to have, um, you know, especially in the affordable housing space, certain funders making what they intend to be good decisions or dis best decisions for all end up actually being hindrances to promoting good design or doing what's right for a certain community. And so I think that there's a, a real desire in my work and a real desire, I think, at Mass to really try to push on these existing systems to help them evolve, to look at it not as just a design problem, but also look at policy and look at, um, you know, look at other ways that we can get ahead or upstream of some of the design decisions that are made. Some of the work that we're doing right now um, with the city of Boston 
um, on the Plan Mattapan project is an example of that, working kind of to develop urban design guidelines, which are community informed and really involve or embed a process um, with the city that is driven by a mission and an impact statement. Yeah, that's great. I, I see a question in the chat, so I'm gonna I shift gears a little bit and just read excellent presentation and body of work. Do you see Boston becoming more open to innovation, innovative design approaches that the city and the region have been in the past? The, than the city have been in the past. What role does the BSA happen have? I would Make hope that Boston can become more open and innovative. I think there's a real opportunity for us to leverage this culture shift, which I think we're all a part of. We're all, you know, we're all, I think, starting to question more about how we, at least as a, as a field, and questioning more about how we do engagement, about whose voices are being heard, about how we translate the goals of others through the skills that we have. And I think that's gonna to lead to innovation. I think diversifying the profession is gonna to lead to innovation. I think elevating others that are traditionally left out of the design process is gonna to lead to innovation. And so I hope that affects Boston and, and really shakes things up. <laughs> um, and I think the BSA has a role in, as an advocate, I think the BSA needs to be a part of this. I think the BSA really has an opportunity to elevate the voices of architects, I think, and, and honestly has a real, I think, mandate to assist improving the value of design. Architects shouldn't be out on their own having to defend that design matters or that architects matter. I think the BSA should be leading that charge. So it looks like we actually have another question in the chat and I, I can read that out. So it says, this is from uh, Reagan Shields. So it says, Patricia, thank you for all of the wonderful work you are doing here in the United States and abroad. In spirit of disruption, how do you see the issues we have dealt with during this global pandemic impacting design moving forward, especially in countries that were already struggling? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that the pandemic has really, across the board, taken the cracks sort of in our systems and our societies and opened them up, right, like wounds. Um, and I think, we were a country that was already struggling. I think our, our the state of our affordable housing is only getting worse as we think about evictions and people losing their jobs and people losing critical family members um, and, and the trauma, honestly, that we're all feeling um, going through this as a community together. Um, I think it will change design. I think the pandemic for, the pandemic I think has for architects, however, probably most clearly identified this link between our personal and emotional health and the space spaces that we occupy. And I think that as I'm talking about like the proof, a <laughs> culture of proof, I think that does a lot sadly for us, right? As architects to prove our value and prove our, prove our worth and prove the importance of quality spaces and quality design. And so I do think there is this uptake um, uptick of it. I think also with the pandemic and with what we're seeing around, you know, a movement of Black Lives Matter and of racial reconciliation and social justice, I think we're seeing architects see space as connected to that form of healing as well. And I think that will, those spaces that we create for spaces for protest, spaces for community gathering, spaces for healing, spaces for memorial memorialization, for honoring, those are going to become, I think, additional incredible spaces that um, hopefully we look back at this time in the pandemic and see those as, as catalysts to something better. So I actually have a question for you. Oh, it looks like there's another question. Uh, so we'll, we can read the one in the chat. Um, so it says, was the ground level community engagement in addition to the mass office already in the works before the pandemic? You mentioned the pandemic exasperating issues in society. Can you speak a little more to what the vision is for the role that community level expansion will play in the future of the firm? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, the, the ground level, mass, mass previously was located on Boylston Street in Boston. We're on the fourth floor of a building that was slated for redevelopment. And prior to the pandemic, kind of got word through the Boston Globe that we were gonna be displaced. And so we had started this process of looking for a new office um, 
before, you know, in 2019. And it always kind of had a vision of how we, we could be at home in Boston that was different than the, the kind of office space we were living. One of our core, I think, tenants at Mass is about, you know, accompanying our partners, but also engaging communities and being really proximate to our work. Um, that I think is an important piece that we were kind of missing being on the fourth floor on Boylston Street. Um, so this move was, was important for us to be more accessible, to be more inclusive. And I think that the opportunity here of being on the ground floor is that people see an architecture firm that has that transparency. And I know that there are others in Boston that are doing that, that, have, that are models for us as well about how you can create greater accessibility and access to design. But the space itself, as I mentioned, we've, we've brought on these space and society fellows who are four young architects really dedicated to this intersection of design and research and engagement. Um, and, re and, and we'll be promoting and providing content for exhibitions once we are open. We'll have additional kind of content on critical issues in society, themes that our team sees as, um, as bodies of work and research that's coming out of our labs, whether that's the Fringe Cities Lab or whether that's uh, deaf space or some of the other topic areas that our team is exploring. And then I hope that it'll also be an event space where people can come in and, and be more a part of the work um, and, and really be a participating role. And I invite you all to join us as well and be a part of that. Awesome. So I can, I'll ask my question now. Um, yeah. So you talked, in the beginning, you talked about the traditional design process where it starts with design and ends with construction. And you start to deconstruct that and say that it actually has more to the beginning and more to the end. And just um, just going more towards the end about occupancy and you talk a little bit about impact studies. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, how you think the impact side of it um, weighs with the rest of the design process. And if you do that on all of your projects. We look to talk, and of all of our projects, we look to define the mission of a project. We then articulate the method or what the design, how the design is going to respond. And then we identify what's the impact gonna be. How, we're gonna, how are we gonna know that we were successful? And that's something that we do with our partners, right? That's, that's their, their goals for the project, their intended impact. How will we know that we collectively are successful? And so that exercise is something that I think really grounds all of our projects and all of our work with this kind of core of research and impact tracking because we're setting those metrics up front. Whether or not we go into the deep dive, like I shared with the maternity waiting village on every project, the answer is no. Um, there's a finite amount of resources, I think, for those types of deep dives. And also that one had a critical, I think, value add, both in terms of the context in which we were working and as a prototype to be able to intervene with design and really understand the value of design decisions in that context and in that place seemed incredibly valuable when we were talking about scaling beyond just the one-off building. We do, however, do a lot of impact tracking at Mass through our construction projects. Um, our team in Rwanda is not just a team of architects, it's a team of engineers, architects, furniture makers, and an entire construction entity. And so with that, presence along the continuum or along this expanded process, we're able to evaluate the impact much deeper to understand the educational impacts, the economic impacts, the environmental impacts, not just in the design phase, but also all the way through construction. And so it is a really critical and fundamental part of, of who we are and what we value. We also look a lot at sort of proxies, research that exists already in the field that we can point to. There's a lot of social science coming out, especially as we talk about community and isolation and how the built environment shapes behavior. There's a lot that we can point to to help us make better design decisions without having to be the first or the original research uh, researchers on the project. So Patricia, I have a question. I'm really fascinated about the labs within yeah. mass, um, you know, and, and I can imagine there's so many 
topics and so many areas of research that you could, you know, isolate and focus on. Um, it seems like you have four, if I remember that correctly. Um, so how did you get to know what the right, you know, number of issues are that you want to tackle without being spread too thin? Or, you know, the flip side of it is how do you maintain that energy and that consistency of research as deadlines and projects become, you know, a real thing? How does that can be consuming in a yep. normal office environment? And how do you keep that research alive and, and, and going instead of just filler work that never happens? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so sometimes, I mean, historically, when mass, you know, would set out to sort of set our strategic plan or strategic goals, we would crowdsource. What are you interested in? What's our team interested in? What are some of the challenges? So for me, it was, it's, you know, the opioid crisis. For other colleagues, it's been different topics of concern to them, whether it's gun violence or whether it's um, affordable housing even, you know. And so those are sort of when we were thinking about where do we want to be working? That's where that original content came from, it came from our staff. We've also, as we've hired people or people have come into our networks and brought their expertise with them. My colleague, Joseph Kunkel is a great example of that. Someone who had an established practice with sustainable native communities, joined Mass's practice a few years ago and is bringing this lab and this research around native communities um, to, to Mass, but also furthering the research that he was already doing. Um, and I think what's unique about Mass that I did, again, didn't talk about too much is that we are structured as a nonprofit that allows us to access philanthropic dollars to support a number of different um, opportunities at Mass, some of which is dedicated to our Catalyst Fund, which goes into the front end of projects to help with that early visioning work that no one seems to be able to afford, especially as a nonprofit, um, before they know there's a project there. And then there's labs, you know, that are also semi-funded, um, often by philanthropic supporters who are also committed to understanding the designer's role in these key topic areas. And so that's that's kind of how we both, I think funding and creating space go hand in hand. Um, because when there's funding for it and there's support for it, there can be that flexibility to, to really dig in on the research and also identify partners. I think that's the other key thing. It's not just research that we're interested, it's identifying the partners who can come alongside us and really do something together. So it's leaders in the food system space, it's leaders in deaf space, it's, it's leaders in addiction and recovery who are really driving the process and we're just looking to, to elevate their vision through design. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so it looks like we have, we have one more question and it looks like we maybe have time for one more question. So I'll, I'll read it um, and then we can wrap up. Um, so the question is, so this is from Kyle Barker. It says, um, thanks Patricia, always great to spend an hour with you. How do you balance a spirit of disruption with a respect for acquired knowledge? I think that's a great, great question, Kyle. Thank you for that one. Um, I actually don't see the disruption as anything that's more, sorry. Um, <laughs> at seven o'clock apparently. <laughs> Talk about disruption, no. <laughs> I actually don't see them at odds. I think they go hand in hand. I think you can't have disruption without expertise. And I think you lose your edge of expertise if you aren't thinking about what's new and fresh and innovative. And so I think they have to go hand in hand. And that is really, I think, where, where Mass as an organization is really great at leveraging the expertise of others within our organization as we've grown. That's been something that we've been, I think, really valuing. Whereas initially, you know, we were young architects, all of us, um, you know, innovating and sort of always sort of reinventing the wheel. I think we've over the years recognized that the partnership is, is what really makes this successful. Sorry for the disruption. <laughs> Well, this has been great. Um, I think we're at the hour. Um, there was room for one more qu question, Raquel, any thought? Um, I'm not seeing any others, but- Can I answer a question? Can I just, add, can I answer my own question? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I think there's, I just, I, we talked about this the other day, so I just wanted to elevate it, which is about like, why, why did I apply for this award? And, and so I just feel like given that there's a few people left and maybe a few days left in the award itself, I was not interested in applying for this award. I d didn't come on my radar. It was a pandemic. I was working full time. I had two kids at home. This is like the last, I was studying for my last ARE exam. Like this was the last thing that I was thinking about doing. And it was because of a colleague who actually nominated me, nominated me and reached out to me and said, I think you should do this. I think this would be great for you. I think you really need to get out there more. Let me help you. Let me think about who do you think you could get your recommendation letters from? And, and it was an important award and, and, and knowing you know, more about Earl Flansburg and like what his values were and how they aligned with masses and mine. And I think understanding the platform granted in a strange year this provides um, as well as just to get to know all of you and those of you that I haven't don't already know tonight. I think it's also like a really great moment to think about like the culture in which we both think about awards and how we pursue them ourselves versus nominate others. And so I would, I would sort of advocate that everyone on this call tonight go and nominate someone for this award and think about who you think should be the young designer in Boston that's recognized next year. Who do you want to hear from? Who would you want to elevate? And I think that's a really important part about changing the culture. Of architecture and supporting each other. So I'll give my shout out to That's, Katie. Yeah, so that nominated That's, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And um, for anyone who's curious, it, 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 there is, you know, um, in the description that it um, is Earl's Flansburg, Flansburg really promoted women, but this is really open to all. And I can say that the last um, winners were, you know, mostly male, in fact. So don't that should not deter anyone. This is open for everyone. And I think that's great. Please nominate somebody or um, promote somebody. That sounds yeah. that sounds like exactly the so right. That's your mandate. Uh, <laughs> go find someone and tell them to apply and help them apply. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. It's wonderful. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. What a great event. Thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was really great. Um, this is awkward. I guess we're supposed to just leave and you have, <laughs> you know, some kids that are anxious to see you. So thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. All right. Thank all you. right. Have a good bye -bye. night. Bye. Right. Good night.